Lunch. My name's Andrew Katz. I'm a lawyer, so I hope you also had lots and lots of coffee to drink. Um, I'm going to be talking about open hardware licensing. Uh, I've been um, practicing open source software licensing for many, many years. More recently, I've been getting involved in open hardware projects. Um, so one of the questions that I'm asked most frequently uh, is, what sort of license should I apply to the project that I'm interested in? And it really depends on whether you fall um, into one of two camps. So if this describes you, I'm happy for anyone to use my design, even if they modify it and keep the modifications to themselves. Right, OK, I haven't used this software before. Uh, then the answer is uh, use the solder pad license. Um, and the solder pad license is a hack of the Apache 2.0 software license. Um, which I did uh, a couple of years back. Um, if you're familiar with the Apache software license, you'll know that it's an extremely permissive license. It lets you do anything with the code, um, including turn it proprietary. Um, and all you have to do is provide a bit of attribution. It works reasonably well for hardware as it stands, uh, but not brilliantly because the terminology is obviously much more um, software related. Um, so I've tweaked the, the terminology a little bit. Uh, and it's called the solder pad license uh, because um, Andrew very kindly let me call it the solder pad license and he's hosting it um, on his website at solderpad.org. So um, if that's your attitude, um, then use the solder pad license. Um, and that's it really. Thanks very much. Uh, goodbye. Thank you for listening. Um, maybe it doesn't describe you though. So. People tend to say, um, I want people to use my designs, uh, but only if when they make modifications and distribute the device, uh, they do so under the same license. So those of you familiar with free and open source software licenses uh, will be familiar with the concept of copyleft, and you'll be familiar with licenses like the GPL. So if that describes you, are you still happy with that, um, even if the license uh, that you're using limits the number of projects people combine your project with? So you'll be um, familiar with the license compatibility problem, if you know anything about free and open source software, which basically makes it very difficult to combine two projects using two different copyleft licenses for the simple reason that each copyleft license demands that the project is uh, relicensed under only under its own license and logically you can't have two different licenses uh, being applied to the same project <laughs> at the same time. Um, so uh, it really, if you're, if, you, if you're operating in the GPL world, then you're really limited to combining your project with other GPL projects or projects that are re released under much more liberal licenses like Apache, uh, but it does make it very difficult um, to use other copyleft licenses uh, like the, um, the open software license. So uh, you get, this, the, you get a, an issue of license compatibility. So it's much easier um, if you're using very simple licenses at the outset, um, like Apache. So OK, let's say that you're still keen on the sort of copyleft-like idea. Um, so um, it, uh, we talked about it limiting the pool of designs that can be combined. What about if it's really, really easy to design around the license um, so that the person taking the license doesn't have to comply with the license terms anyway? Um, and I'll talk a little bit in greater depth um, uh, about the issues, but there's essentially when it comes to licensing hardware, um, there is a real problem with actually trying to allow um, copyleft licenses to stick. It's much easier to design around them than it would be with an equivalent open source software <coughs> license. And if, after all that, uh, you're still happy that that's your attitude, then probably the best bet for you is the CERN Open Hardware License, um, which is another license that um, I've been involved with. Um, the one caveat for that um, is whether you have some patents. And to be honest, most open hardware projects are pretty unlikely to have any patents. Um, but if they do, um, then there is an argument um, for using a third license, um, which is the Tapper open hardware license, um, and uh, that's, uh, I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about how that, that works later. So getting copyleft to work in hardware um, is something that is really, really difficult to do. Um, and there's a number of problems. So there's the IP mess problem. 
um, which basically means there's a whole bundle of different sorts of intellectual property that apply to hardware um, in a different way to the way that um, intellectual property applies to software. Um, there's a stickability problem, which is the problem of making the copyleftness of the license actually work in practice. Um, there's the boundary problem, um, which is analogous to the linking problem that we have in software. So, in other words, if you have a couple of sub-assemblies, um, to what extent uh, does, one it, um, does the license applicable to one sub-assembly dictate the license that has to be applied to the other sub-assembly? Um, there's a cost differential problem, um, which is to do with the fact that, by definition, everything that is hardware actually has to be consist of atoms and has to be made, so there's effort involved in making it and there's effort involved in sticking the atoms together. Um, and there's the compatibility problem, um, which we've talked about as far as having um, different copyleft licenses. So if we look at each one of those particular issues in, problem, um, I issues in, in turn, um, so software is in the main covered by copyright. Um, okay, patents are involved sometimes, and there's also some sort of occasional peripheral issues like trade secrets, etc. But in the main, software is covered by copyright, and the software licenses are primarily um, uh, software uh, that are primarily copyright licenses which are dependent on distribution. Um, hardware um, can be covered by copyright, uh, but not always. Um, it can be covered by patent. There are more hardware patents around the place uh, than there are on software patents, so that's something to be aware of. Uh, there's various different sorts of design rights, and that's a mess in itself. In the UK alone, there are four completely different and separate sorts of design rights um, operating in parallel. Two of them are registered, two of them are unregistered, uh, two of them are domestic, two of them are European. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a sort of real, real confusing mess. And then there's some sort of weird special sorts of intellectual property, um, such as semiconductor uh, mask rights. So it's much more difficult to draft a license in the context of hardware because you have to deal with all of these very disparate sorts of intellectual property um, rather than just focusing on, on copyright. So the next problem is the stickability problem. Now, with software, every time you run software, um, every time you change it or every time you distribute it or you lend or use it or make it available to other people, you're going to need a copyright license. And every time there is an opportunity uh, every time a copyright license is applied, there's an opportunity to add conditions to that license. So it means that those conditions can be the copyleft conditions. So typical life cycle of a piece of software means that there's an opportunity for, that, uh, for copyright law to impinge on it um, you know, many, 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 many times. And every single time that impingement happens, that's an opportunity to apply conditions to allow things like copyleft to work. Um, this is much less likely to be true for hardware, um, so the licenses are uh, they're much more difficult to apply. I mean, if you, th if you think about it, um, you know, just handing a hammer to somebody is not something that um, requires any intellectual property rights to do that. So you can't control the handing of that hammer over to somebody um, using um, some sort of license um, attached to, to intellectual property. So that's, that's a real problem, um, is that if you're drafting a hardware license, the opportunity to allow that license to impinge on whatever you're doing with the hardware um, is, is much more com uh, complicated. Um, the boundary problem. So uh, this is um, where we have a number of different modules and we want to combine them. Um, and again, you know, in software, it's complicated enough. I mean, there's plenty of debate about um, whether uh, GPL code, um, when it's linked to uh, another piece of code, um, whether that means that the other piece of code has to be released under the GPL, and there's differences of opinion between, on the one hand, the Free Software Foundation and Larry Rosen. And, and, but, but even so, there's, there's a generally understood, at least there's generally understood norms in terms of the boundaries um, at which the, 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 the license um, impinges on different modules when you combine them in various different ways. Um, with hardware, it really is uh, dramatically more, <coughs> more different, uh, difficult to do that. Um, you know, it, it's by no means clear um, that if you have a particular sub-assembly for a I don't know, piece of car suspension, um, when you bolt that onto the chassis, then it suddenly means that uh, the whole of the chassis has to be made available under um, some sort of open hardware license. So that creates a particular problem, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a difficult one um, to tackle. Um, there's the cost differential problem as well, and this, this is quite a subtle one. Um, but basically, you can replicate software perfectly for zero cost. So if you want to take a Linux distribution, you can replicate that perfectly uh, just by copying it on the computer, and it costs 0.000p in terms of you know, the, amount of, um, uh, the amount of electricity 
uh, that you're using to do that. Um, if, on the other hand, um, you wanted something that had exactly equivalent functionality to a Linux distribution, or let's say just a Linux kernel, um, and you wanted to reverse engineer it and recreate it, um, then there are various um, sort of interesting figures kicking around. But the most recent estimate is that it costs between three and four trillion dollars to recreate the Linux kernel from scratch in terms of the amount of effort that has gone into making it. So really, if you want to use something that has the functionality of the Linux kernel, um, but you don't want to comply with the license which applies to it, which is the GPL, uh, the two options are um, either um, you pay um, a whole bunch of coders to uh, reverse engineer and completely recreate the Linux kernel, and that's going to cost you between three and four trillion dollars. Um, or you actually decide that you're prepared to live with the, uh, with the GPL. And um, in a lot of cases, people, have, well, in all cases, when people have used Linux, they've decided that, yeah, they're prepared to live with the GPL. They don't really want to invest three to four trillion dollars in recreating a piece of software so that they can do whatever they like with it. Um, it's not quite so simple with hardware, because hardware um, always uh, involves materials. So even slavishly copying something is going to have some cost and effort involved in it. Um, and then there's um, also the manufacturing process as well. So I have to say this is, this is not, not so much a, a, a not as good a sort of thought through argument as the other points. But I think this, this, it seems to me that there is still um, you know, greater ease in uh, reverse engineering something um, in the hardware domain than th that there is likely to be in the software domain. Now that's a hugely sweeping statement and you'll be able to immediately come up with counterexamples to that. Um, but it's probably something that um, you know, does um, at least in certain cases, um, have some merit in it as an argument. Um, and uh, so we've touched on the incompatibility problem. I mean, there's no real difference here um, between the worlds of software um, and hardware. Um, if you've got copyleft licenses, then it is very difficult to combine projects using different copyleft licenses. So ideally, you want to, if you are going to have a copyleft license, you really, need only, you, you, you really only want to have one. Um, as soon as you have more than one copyleft license, then this, this um, uh, uh, compatibility um, issue arises. So despite all of that, if you decide that uh, you still want to use some form of copyleft license, um, probably the best one to consider is the CERN open hardware, uh, hardware license. Uh, so how does that work? Um, well, it attaches to the documentation. Um, so you take the design files, design documentation, which of course you know, may, may um, include electronic files, CAD files, whatever, um, and you attach the CERN license to it. Um, and um, and, and it, it kicks in when you do anything with the documentation that actually needs a license. Now the reality is, um, you know, most sorts of uh, construction that you can imagine are going to involve doing something with that documentation. So, you know, the obvious example is if you're doing something like um, feeding it into a CNC machine, um, then clearly the documentation is going to have to be adapted and copied in some way to be fed into the machine to make it work, and that's an opportunity to make the license impinge. Um, and uh, likewise, um, you know, if you're... Um, making um, circuit boards, for example, then you'll take the design documentation, it may actually be a mask for the circuit board, and you'll actually be copying the physical image of that mask onto the circuit, and that's something that needs a license, and therefore that's, that's an opportunity for the, the um, rights um, in the CERN Open Hardware license to impinge. Um, the difficulty is that, under English law at least, um, it's not a breach of copyright to create a 3D object out of a 2D design if there's no actual um, sort of document to document copying involved. So if um, you happen to have some design drawings of, to take a not particularly random example, um, a stormtrooper's helmet, and then you use those to create a 3D instance of a stormtrooper's <coughs> helmet, then that's something that doesn't require a license, and therefore um, any form of copyleft that, is th that you try to attach to it isn't going to work, because you can do it without a license at all anyway. And that's just uh, you know, a peculiarity um, of English law. And it also um, highlights that another problem that we have with hardware is that copyright is pretty consistent in terms of its application throughout the world, at least in the way it applies to software. Um, the way that these other intellectual property rights apply to hardware do vary quite significantly from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So you have a lot more certainty in terms of the way that software licenses are going to work worldwide um, than you do in terms um, of hardware licenses. Um, 
So what, what happens is, um, assuming that um, you have done what is the most likely thing to do um, with a piece of um, design documentation that's covered by the, the CERN open hardware license and you've created a, a piece of hardware from it, um, then um, as soon as you distribute that piece of hardware to somebody else, um, that's at the point at which you are obliged to make the design documentation available um, to, to other people. Um, and there's a, there's a sort of subtle legal hack involved in, in making that work, which I won't go into it in, uh, at the moment. Um, but essentially, that's the obligation. It's triggered by the, uh, the first distribution of a design that is made, um, or a piece of hardware that's made that particular design. Um, in the unlikely event that you're involved in a, a hardware project um, that does have um, some, some patents, um, and the very nature of the um, open hardware, open source development method means that's pretty unlikely, because if you're being open with the designs all the way through the design process, then it means that you're basically publishing everything every step of the way, um, and therefore it means that you'll no longer have the appropriate secrecy um, to enable you to take... Um, that would take out a patent. So it's pretty, and it's also expensive, and it's time consuming, and it's lengthy, and it, it, it just really doesn't really fit in very well. The, the only circumstances in which it might happen is if you have um, a bunch of um, corporate entities who are getting together and trying to, to use this sort of model, um, an open hardware model, um, for their own, their own purposes, but they probably use a different license for that anyway. Um, but anyway, having said that, if you happen to have any patents, um, there is a license that does work fairly well um, if you have patents, and that's the, that's the Tapper Open Hardware license. Um, there is another sort of technical legal hack um, that we could use um, that I'm sort of discussing with CERN at the moment. Um, that means that any recipient of a piece of hardware is granted a contractual right to demand the design documents from anyone upstream. Um, and there's a million and one ways why that's not going to work particularly well um, from, a, from a practical point of view, but a legal point of, from a legal point of view, it might. Um, but I'm fairly uncomfortable about that um, because it really changes the whole model of the way that licensing works. So software licensing, the only people that can claim um, under, for example, the GPL of software, the copyright owners in the first place. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're not the copyright owner of a piece of GPL code, you can't complain um, what anyone else does with it. You have to be a copyright owner of that code. Um, what we're doing is we're turning it on its head and saying that anyone that re receives um, a piece of, of hardware um, which is made to this new open design license, which we haven't drafted yet, um, is entitled to receive a copy of the design documents. But it needs a lot of thinking through before we, we release that one into the wild because it's, it's got some potentially serious ramifications for liability and so on. Um, and uh, people try to use other licenses, um, particularly uh, GPL, LGPL, and Creative Commons, um, which are not really designed uh, for use in a hardware context. So they do try to use those um, as, as well. Um, the reasons why it doesn't, doesn't work particularly well, terminology it isn't really designed for hardware. Um, it is primarily a software distribution license. Um, and as I said before, distributing hardware doesn't normally require a license in the same way uh, the software does. Um, you know, if, if, uh, as I said before, if I hand a hammer over to you, that doesn't mean that I need a license to give you the hammer. Um, whereas if I copy a piece of software for you, because software, these, I mean, if I hand you over a CD of something, then I'm distributing that CD, uh, and that's something that does have an effect under copyright law. So um, it, it's, um, uh, that, that, that's, that's something that the GPL relies on, and trying to apply it to, to hardware doesn't really work quite very, uh, work, work particularly well. Um, Creative Commons uh, doesn't work particularly well in an environment where you have something that's got um, source code and object code. So in this case, you've got the design documents and you've got um, the, the, the actual object itself. Um, but uh, you know, it's okay for the design documents <coughs> themselves. If you distribute the design documents, it, it's, going, it's going to work. But the share-alike thing doesn't impinge on the item itself. So if you make modifications to the documentation and you keep the modifications to yourself, but you made loads and loads of designs, uh, to the, the, to the modified form, but you don't distribute the modified designs, then Creative Commons really doesn't have anything to say about that. So it's, it's essentially, it's a huge loophole. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with um, free and open source software licensing, it's, it's sort of similar um, to the SAS loophole that people identified in, in the GPL. Um, so it, it's, um, okay, you can use uh, Creative Commons, but you have to be aware that there are some major problems with it. Uh, Creative Commons specifically excludes patents. Um, it doesn't, there's no sort of patent license in there 
So even if somebody grants you a design, um, the, the right to use a design under the Creative Commons, you won't automatically get a right to any patents they hold that are necessary to create that design. Um, and um, so I stumbled recently across an organization called Local Motors. Anyone come across that? Yeah. Um, so they claim to be an open source um, hardware company, uh, but actually um, the designs are released on a non-commercial basis, only if you use them for commercial purposes, then there's a sort of royalty flow involved. So strictly speaking, that, you know, that's not open source, there's a use restriction on, on there as well. So uh, people, people are sort of misusing the terminology um, open source. Uh, there's another one you may have come across, which is the Open Compute Project license, uh, but it's not really a, a hardware license, it's actually a standards license, um, and doesn't, doesn't actually work at all if there are no patents involved. It's, it's sort of, bits of it are completely undefined, it's, it's uh, rather strangely drafted. <laughs> so, summary, um, I heartily recommend the solder pad license because it's your simplest option. Um, if, on the other hand, you want to try to um, apply some sort of copyleft to what you're doing, then you're probably best off using the CERN open hardware license, uh, not necessarily because it's definitely going to work, but at the very least it'll generate sort of fear, uncertainty and doubt um, in the minds of the people that are trying to rip you off, so that might go some way to <laughs> helping you out. Um, so be aware of its limitations. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for listening.